Have you ever been at a point where you would say, I'm ashamed? For a variety of reasons. Whatever it may be in your life, have you ever been ashamed of something? For some people, it's, uh, it's, it's our appearance that we're ashamed of. Some of us are too tall or too short, too skinny or too not so skinny. Uh, you know, for, for some of us, you know, we, we don't like the fact we've got to wear glasses. You know, we don't, we don't like our complexion. We don't like our hair or what, what the, the, the other thing that, that, that used to be up there. There's set, is there anything about your appearance, maybe earlier in your life, where you said, you know, I just I wasn't, real, wasn't real proud of myself, the way I looked? You ever been embarrassed? You ever been ashamed by anything in your life? You ever been ashamed by maybe your, your financial status? You don't maybe have as nice a car as somebody else has. You might not have as nice a house. Maybe you pull up and in your car and you hope somebody doesn't see you. Maybe you, you ask your parents to drop you off down at the corner so that your friends don't see you get out of that car uh, when you're going to school. Maybe it's that you don't have the, the latest and the greatest and the, uh, the most uh, uh, recent technology and you're several generations behind where everybody else is and is that something that embarrasses you? Have you ever been at a point in your life where you say, I'm ashamed? You ever been ashamed of your family members? Did you ever have somebody in your family that you were just ashamed that they were a part of your family? You were embarrassed that they were a part of your family. For some of you, it used to be your parents, that you were ashamed of your parents. You know, it used to be, and this is back in the dark ages, where families used to actually go to the store together. Can you imagine such a, such a ridiculous idea? But it used to be that families would go to the store. Sometimes, brace yourselves, sometimes they'd go to the mall together. Ugh, they would go to the mall together. But I'll tell you what you would never see. You would never see that teenager walking anywhere near his mother or father when they were walking around the store. Not going to be seen with them. Now, the teens always thought it was because they were ashamed of their parents. Not realizing that sometimes their parents were walking a little bit faster. Maybe didn't want to be seen with their teen. Have, have you ever had one of those family members that you were just a little ashamed? A little ashamed of who they were. A little ashamed of what they were doing in their lives. You know, there's a number of things that we could look at, a number of things that we could list, say, you know, what is it about our lives? Is there anything about your past? Anything about your past that you could say, I'm ashamed of that. I'm ashamed I ever did that. I'm ashamed I ever said that. I'm ashamed I ever went down that road of life. Maybe it's, maybe it's a family background. You look back and you say, you know, I just, I can't believe I was ever a part of something like that a number of things in our lives where we could look back and say, you know, I'm just ashamed of that. Have you ever been ashamed of your name? For some of you, it's, you know, it's, it's not, not that big of a deal. Michael Erickson. You know, there, there's nothing, nothing there to, to really have any shame about. Joe Holland. You know, that's just pretty, pretty ordinary. I have known preachers with the last name of Pig, last name of Hog, last name of Butt. You'd be one of their children going to school and growing up. How difficult is that going to be where you would go to school and perhaps even be ashamed of your own name? But this morning, obviously, we're talking about something that's even more important, more critical than that. Have you ever been ashamed of your faith? Have you ever been ashamed of that you're a Christian? Have you ever been ashamed that you believe in the Bible? Have you ever been ashamed that you go to church? Have you ever been ashamed that you believe in Jesus, that He's the Son of God? You know, and, and this, 
this kind of uh, manifests itself in, in, in a number of different ways. Sometimes when, when you're a teenager, you, you think being a Christian is kind of, you know, it's kind of crimping my style here. You know, I, because there's some things that I can't do. And you might get invited to a party and, well, no, I can't go because... Well, I just can't go. I, I, you know, I just, I, I, I'm not going to tell you why I can't go, because i got to go to church, but I, I, just, I, I just, I can't go. Or we'll make up some reason, some excuse, instead of saying, I can't go to that because I'm a Christian. I won't go to that because I'm a Christian. I won't be there because instead I'm going to be down at the church with my church family. Instead of saying that, sometimes we're embarrassed. Sometimes we're ashamed. It might be that you are at a dinner party with fellow workers, with friends. Everybody goes around the table placing their order for their cocktail, for their adult beverage. And it comes to you. What are you going to order? And what is everybody going to think about you when you place your order for something that is different than what everybody else at the table has ordered. And sometimes it may manifest itself in a number of ways, but sometimes it may be that we are ashamed. We're embarrassed by our faith. Are, are you one of those people that you believe that you actually have to be dunked under water and brought back up in order to have your sins taken away? You, you believe that? You, you're a part of that church. You're a part of that church that doesn't use instrumental music in your worship. Number of things, perhaps. Number of things that could be said, a number of situations that we could be placed in. Have you ever been ashamed? Have you ever been embarrassed by your faith? Because you're a Christian. Paul says in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Do you believe that? Is that something that you can say with all of your heart? I want to give you the opportunity. I want us this morning to say this line right here together. Can we say this together? And, and, and I know it's easy to say in here because everybody's going to say it in here. This is the easy place to say it. But well, let's see if we can say this out loud, and let's say it together. Start with me. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Do you believe that? Don't let it just be words that come out of your mouth. Do you believe that? Is that something that comes from your heart? You know, when we're in leadership training camp with our young people, sometimes we will read a verse with them. And in order to help them to understand a verse, what it's saying, sometimes we will emphasize each word in the verse, in order to let that verse, in order to let those words come off of the page, in order to make you, because sometimes you know you read a verse and you just run right through it. Sometimes when you start emphasizing each, even insignificant words, it'll help you understand what that verse says. And I thought about doing that with this whole verse, but there is a sermon to be preached this morning. But I want us to say that again, and I want us to emphasize one word that is the word not. I want us to say together, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but when we get to the word not, I want you to punch it just a little bit harder. Let's say this together. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Is that you? Is that your heart? I hope that it is. I hope that when, when we live as Christians, that we don't walk around embarrassed by the fact that we believe in Christ embarrassed by the fact that we go to church, embarrassed by the fact that we live by a moral principle that is founded upon God and His truth and not man and his fluctuating relative idea of what morality is. Don't ever be ashamed of the faith that you have. This morning I want you to turn your Bibles. Instead of Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, Paul says there in Romans 1, 16, I'm not ashamed. He says it again over in 2 Timothy Chapter 1 and verse 12. And I want you to go park your Bibles in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. Because Paul says in both of these verses, I am not ashamed. But when we get over to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, he gives us four keys. He gives us four key principles. In 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, 
that if we will adopt these, if we will use these keys, we will be able, like Paul, to say, I am not ashamed. Are you, are you with me? 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, where Paul begins that verse. He, he tells Timothy, by the way, back in verse 8, not to be ashamed. But he says in verse 12, For this reason I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed. Key number one, Paul, why are you not ashamed? Look at what he says. For I know whom I have believed. How can we get to the point where we, like Paul, can say, I am not ashamed? Key number one is, you need to get to know your God. Paul says, I know whom I have believed. Do you know God? I'm not asking, do you know his name? I'm not asking, you, have you heard of him? I'm not asking, have you read his book? I'm asking, do you know God? When you know God, you won't be ashamed. You won't be ashamed to say that you know God. I, as a Christian, I need to get to the point where I can say unequivocally, where I can say God is mine. I know him, and I'm not ashamed of that. If you were to try to select a Bible character, that you would say he knew God? Who would you choose? There's no wrong answer to this because there's so many possibilities, but who would you say this person, he knew God? They were, they were in a relationship that it wasn't just that God was someone in heaven, he knew God. Why don't you turn your Bibles to the book of Psalms for a minute? We, we won't look at these verses in their entirety, but I want you to turn to the book of Psalms because I believe that a man that the Bible describes as a man after God's own heart is a man that knew God. You think David knew God? Not heard him, not heard about him, not knew about him. Do you think David knew God? I would encourage you to read through the Psalms. I've got two of them listed on the screen, and we, we won't even ta have time to look at both of these in their entirety. But I want you to read these psalms and think about, do I know God like David knew God? Look in Psalm 139. O oh Lord, you have searched me, and you have known me. You know when I sit down, you know when I rise up. God, you, you know everything about me. You comprehend my path. You comprehend when I'm lying down, verse 3. There's nothing I can say, verse 4, but you know what I'm going to say. Verse 5, you have hedged me behind and before. God, you've placed a hedge about me, and you've laid your hand upon me. Now, some of you go back to your childhood days, and you think about the days when your dad laid his hand upon you. That's not what David is talking about here. God, you put a hedge around me and you laid your hand. You laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge. To think about the fact that you know me, you care about me, you've been there for me, such knowledge is just, it's too wonderful for me. He goes on to say, God, where can I go that you're not there? Where can I go that you're not going to be there for me? In fact, he even says down in verse 10, even there your hand will lead me and your right hand, your right hand's going to hold me. And here I am and I'm saying, surely the darkness is going to fall upon me down in verse 11. Bad things are coming. Darkness is coming. And the, David says, even the night, God, is light to you. There's no darkness that I can fall in that you won't be there. There's no darkness in my life that I can go through that you will not be my light. That you will not hold me by the hand. Verse 14, I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you, and when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest places of the earth, your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed. And in your book, they were all written. Verse 17, how precious 
Do you know God? David knew God. And David said, how precious also are your thoughts to me. Are God's thoughts precious to you? David goes on and says in verse 23, search me, O God. Know my heart. God, I want you to get to know me because, God, I want to get to know you. Look over in Psalm 145. In Psalm 145, David says, I will extol you, my Lord, O King, and I will bless your name forever and ever. Every day I will bless you. I will praise your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. Look in verse 8. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion, slow to anger and great in mercy. The Lord is good to all and His tender mercies are over all of His works. Look in verse 17. The Lord is righteous in all His ways, gracious in all His works. The Lord is near to all who call upon Him, to all who call upon Him in truth. On and on we could go through this, through this psalm. I wish we could look at every verse. David knew God. He knew his heart. When he came before God, it was not some distant God in some distant place that he talked to. It was a God he knew intimately. I want to issue you a challenge. For 2016, I want to issue you a challenge. To be able to say, I am not ashamed. To be able to say that by getting to know your God. And here's the challenge I would like to give to you. It's a challenge that I give to myself. And so I put it in the first person on the screen. The challenge is to get to know God. To get to know my God by getting into His revelation to me and letting it, let, getting into that revelation and letting it get into me. We've started a new year. And oftentimes, this is when individuals start reading through the Bible. And out in the lobby, we have schedules where you can read through the Bible in a year, or you can read through the Bible in three years. And sometimes we start down that path, and we do pretty well, and then we miss a day or two, and we get discouraged, and we stop. May I encourage you to get into God's book this year, and don't stop. You say, it's a, it's a big book. 66 books. I've never read 66 books in my entire life, let alone in a single year. If you don't think you can read through the Bible this year, what if you read through the book of Psalms this year? Read one psalm each day. And not just read it, but meditate on it. Let it get into you and get to know God. If you want more than that, then read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John when you read the Psalms. And I guarantee if you'll read those five books of the Bible this year, by this time next year, you will know God. And when you say God is mine, how can you ever, ever be ashamed? The reality is you can't. Come back to 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12, key number 2. Key number 1, if we're going to be able to say, I'm not ashamed... Is to, say, is to get to know God. Paul says, I'm not ashamed, for I know whom, well, look at what he says, I know whom I have believed. Paul's confidence in God came from the fact that he had a full trust in his God. Challenge number two for you this year is to grow in your trust of God. To be able to say, I trust God. To be able to say, my God, He is faithful. I trust Him and I'm not ashamed. Again, let me ask you a question. If you were to try to think of a Bible character that really trusted God, if you were to try to think of a Bible character that you would say, this person really had a deep faith in God, who would you choose? And, and again, the possibilities are, are, are numerous but I want you to turn to Acts chapter 27. I want us to look at the example of Paul as a man who fully and truly trusted God. Look at Acts chapter 27. As you turn there, you probably know that this is a chapter that talks about Paul being involved in a shipwreck. 
But it's not just any old shipwreck. Paul is a prisoner. He's being taken to Rome as a prisoner aboard this ship with other prisoners. And they get out in the middle of the Mediterranean Sea, and they get involved in a storm to the point that the end of this story, this ship is going to fall apart. The end of this story is this ship is going to fall apart, and the only way these people are going to survive is they got to grab a piece of that ship and float and swim to shore in order to live. Paul is in the middle of that kind of a storm. The storm's so bad that verse 18 says, We were exceedingly tempest-tossed. The next day we lightened the ship. Verse 19, The third day we threw out the ship's tackle overboard with our own hands. Verse 20, Now when neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, no small tempest beat upon us. All hope that we would be saved was finally given up. Put yourself on board that ship. There's no hope. No hope. All hope that we're going to be saved is gone. We are dead. Verse 21. But after long abstinence from food, Paul stood in the midst of them and said, Men, you should have listened to me and not have sailed from Crete and incurred this disaster and loss. And now I urge you to take heart, for there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. What are you talking about, Paul? All the hope that we're going to be saved is lost. And who are you? You're standing up and saying, we're not going to lose our lives. Are you nuts? Open your eyes, Sir Paul. Look around you. We're doomed. We're dead. There's no Coast Guard. There's no helicopters. There's no Air Force. There's no Navy. There's no nobody coming to save us. We're dead. What does Paul say? Verse 23. For there stood by me this night an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve. This isn't just some God. This is the God. I belong to him. I serve him. And he told me something. Here's what he told me in verse 24. Do not be afraid, Paul. You must be brought before Caesar. And indeed, God has granted you all those who sail with you. Translation. God has saved everybody on the ship. All hope that we were going to be saved, lost. The angel comes to God and says, God has saved everybody on the ship. Nobody is going to die. So what does Paul say in verse 25? Therefore take heart, men, for I believe God. The New King James says that it will be just as he told me. I think it's the New American Standard that says, that it will turn out exactly as he told me. When Paul heard what God said, he did not doubt it one bit. All the circumstances, all the circumstances said the opposite. The appearance of what they're going through doesn't, no, Lord, this doesn't make sense. There's no way you're going to save us. Everything looked the other direction. But when God said something, Paul believed it. Paul trusted it. And Paul said, I know it is going to happen. And it's not just going to happen sort of like what God says. It's going to turn out exactly as God said. Do you have that kind of trust? Do you have the kind of trust in your God that when he says something, you know it's going to be exactly like he said. When he said there is a place where there is no sorrow, no pain, no death, no crying, do you believe it will be exactly like he said? When he said, I go to prepare a place for you that I may come and receive you, do you believe it exactly? you believe that the Bible says that he's going to return in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of Christ? Do you believe it'll happen that way exactly? Here's our challenge. Here's my challenge for me, my challenge for all of us this year when it comes to our faith in God is that I need to grow in my trust for God so that I can become like Paul. So that I can get to the point in my faith with God that I take him at his word. 
Whatever he says, I take him at his word without question. And I don't doubt anything that he says. Is that where your faith is today? Do you have the kind of faith like Paul did? Whatever God says, that's exactly what God means. That's exactly the way it'll happen. And when I have that kind of trust, why would I ever be ashamed? When I have that kind of faith in God, how could I ever be ashamed of that faith? Go back to 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12. Four keys in this passage for me not to be ashamed of my faith. Number one, Paul says, For I know whom I have believed. I need to get to know my God. I know whom I have believed. I need to grow in my trust. And then look at what he says. And I am persuaded that he is able. If I want to get to the point where I can say, as Paul did, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, I need to grasp the power of God. I need to get to the point where I am able to say God is able. And I need Him. I need my God. I can't, I'm not ashamed of Him. I need Him. I need Him in my life. And again, if I were to ask you, who, who epitomizes this in Scripture? There's so many different ones. But there's one character named Abraham. Throughout the Old Testament, obviously, talked about and we won't take time to look detailed over in Romans chapter 4, but he's talked about in Romans chapter 4. And a lot of what Romans chapter 4 is about is talking about Abraham's faith. And when it comes to Abraham's faith, God came to Abraham and told Abraham that he was going to have a child. Abraham's 100 and his wife is 90. Hello, would that get your attention? Abraham, you're going to have a son. Your wife's going to have a son. You're 100, your wife is 90. And in Romans chapter 4, the Bible indicates Abraham didn't blink an eye. He, he looked at the age of his body, he looked at, the Bible says, the deadness of his wife's womb. She had never had a child, and he did not blink an eye. Are you serious? You know, could you do that? If God came and told you that, would you be looking around for the hidden camera? Would you be saying, okay, what's going to happen next? You know, are, are you going to believe it when God, because that just sounds, that just sounds like there's just no possible way that's going to happen. But when you get down to Romans chapter 4 and verse 21, not only talks about that Abraham had faith in God, but it says that Abraham was fully, hear this, he was fully convinced that God was able to perform that which he had promised. Abraham was fully convinced that God was able. I'm 100, she's 90, no big deal. Now if I'm 200, it's not going to be a big deal because with God, all things are possible. Abraham believed in the power of God. Sometime, do a study on the word able in your New Testament. And study what God is able to do for you. And see if you believe it. In Hebrews 7 and verse 25, He is able to save us to the uttermost. No matter what I have done, no matter how evil I've been, no matter what sin I've committed, God is able to take that sin away and save me. Do you believe that? Do you believe that God is able to aid you when you are tempted in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 17 and 18? Do you believe that? That when you are going through some kind of a temptation, that God is there and God is able. He has the power to get you out of that. When you think about what God is able to do for you, Perhaps you think about other verses with that word able where the Bible says that God is able to keep you from stumbling in Jude verse 24. God can keep you from stumbling as a Christian. The Bible says He is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ever ask or think. Do you believe 
in the power of God? Do you believe that the power of God is working in your life? Our challenge for 2016 is to be able to grasp God's power personally. To go back to the Bible and see His power working in the lives of His people. And to see His people, like Abraham, saying, being fully convinced that whatever God promised, He was able to do. And to come to a point in our life where we have the faith that says, if God is for us, what's the rest of that verse say? Who can be against us? Can I challenge you to change a pronoun? Can I challenge you to change it from us, plural, to me, singular? Do you have the faith that says, if God is for me, who can be against me? When the God of heaven is for you, how could you ever be ashamed of him? When he wants to save you, when he wants to take you to heaven, how could you ever be ashamed of him? The last key that's in 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 12, Paul says, I am persuaded that he is able to keep what I have committed unto him until that day. If we're going to be able to say, I'm not ashamed, then we have to be able to get to the point where we give ourselves fully to God where I get to the point where I am able to say, God is unfailing. And I surrender to Him. And I'm not ashamed to say it. Again, if you were to try to think of some Bible character, who would you try to think of who gave himself fully to God, recognizing that God is unfailing? In Hebrews chapter 11, we are reminded about Moses. Moses who was raised in Pharaoh's house. Moses who had all of the power that he could ever want. Had all of the prestige that he could ever want. Had all of the prosperity that he could ever want. Had all of the possessions that he could ever want. He had all of the pleasure being the son of Pharaoh's daughter, he had all of the pleasure that he could ever want. He's living in, as, as, in, in Pharaoh's house. There's nothing that could be withheld from him. Put yourself in Moses' place. I can stay here where there's prestige and power and prosperity and pleasure, and possessions galore. And I can have all that I want. Or I can go and suffer with the people of God. Which one would you choose? If those are your two options, which one of those would you choose? The Bible tells us that Moses made a choice putting aside all that he could have had and did have, he surrendered himself unto God because he recognized something. He recognized that prestige will ultimately fail him. That power will ultimately fail him. That prosperity and pleasures and possessions will ultimately fail him. But he knew that God never would fail him. He went over and he gave his life to God. Surrendered himself to the Lord. I want to ask you a question this morning. Have you done that? As you look at those two choices, the same choices that we have today, that's our challenge for this year, is to surrender ourselves to the Lord. To give ourselves over to him, knowing that there's nothing that compares to God, not even me. Nothing compares to Him. Nothing that I have or could have can compare to Him. Everything else is going to fail, but He never will. And if I'll have that kind of a heart and that kind of a, uh, of a, of a faith, 
why would I ever be ashamed of God? We're starting a new year. There's an opportunity for you to make choices today that say, I don't want to worry about that stuff in the past anymore. I'm going to start today. And from this day forward, I am going to say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. I'm going to I, I, I'm going to get to know God more this year. I'm going to grow in my trust. I'm going to grasp His power, and I'm going to give myself to Him more and more. You might have guessed. You might have guessed what our theme for this year is going to be at Palm Beach Lakes. Could you get an idea? Is it possible that you might have some inkling of a clue as to what our theme for 2016 is going to be? I'm not ashamed. Does, this, does, that, does that have an appeal to us? Is that not practical? Is that not what we all need today? In the midst of a, of a culture that is trying to suppress us, is trying to put us down and shut us up as Christians, do we not need to be able to say, no, I'm a Christian and I'm not ashamed to say that I am a Christian, that I stand up for God and I stand with God. If there's any time where we need to be able to stand up and say, I'm not ashamed, it's now. It is today. And so as we did last year, we're going to take this theme and each month we will develop the theme and have a different emphases each month as we go through. And so in January we're going to talk about, I'm not ashamed to spread the gospel, which goes right along with our emphasis on Mission Sunday, uh, that uh, we have our Mission Sunday, the last uh, the last Sunday of this month. And so that's going to be our emphasis this month. I'm not ashamed. I'm not ashamed to spread the gospel. Next month, we're going to talk about I'm not ashamed to follow Jesus. I don't care what everybody else is doing. I'm not ashamed to follow Jesus. In March, we're going to emphasize I'm not ashamed to be called a Christian. You can call me whatever. I'm not ashamed to be called a Christian. In our gospel meeting that month, Sam Jones is going to be back. If you've been a part of this congregation, you know how much we love Sam Jones. Sam Jones will be here the first week of March, and our theme for that meeting is going to be, you can just be a Christian. You can be just a Christian. You don't have to worry about it. You can be just a Christian. And that's our emphasis that month. I'm not ashamed to be called a Christian. In April, I'm not ashamed to wash feet. What's that all about? I don't know if I want to be here in April. You know, I, I might skip that month. You know, uh, I'm not ashamed to wash feet. Jesus washed feet. I'm not ashamed to wash others' feet and to serve them. I'm not too good for that. In May, I'm not ashamed to stand for truth. We're going to have our evangelism training for youth that, that month. Eric Lyons from Apologetics Press will be here. And so what a great month to say, I'm not ashamed to stand up for truth. In June, we're going to talk about, I'm not ashamed to defend godly marriages. That's hard to do today. That's not popular today because godly marriages are being torn apart today. I'm not ashamed as a Christian to defend godly marriages. I'm not ashamed to talk about Jesus. He's my Savior. He's my friend. He's my Lord. I'm not ashamed to talk about Him. That'll be our emphasis in July. I am not ashamed in August to live a holy life. The world doesn't want me to do it. The world wants me to be conformed to them. I'm not ashamed that I'm a Christian. And I'm not ashamed to live a holy life. In September, I'm not ashamed to belong to His church. I'm a Christian. I'm a member of the body of Christ, and I am not ashamed of that. In October, I'm not ashamed to enjoy worship. It's going to be different than what we did last year. I'm not ashamed to come here and enjoy worshiping God. He wants us to enjoy it. In November, I'm not ashamed to rely on God. I'm not ashamed to admit it. I'm not ashamed to admit to my friends that I rely on God. I need Him. I can't live without Him. Our lectureship is always in November. The theme of our lectureship in November is going to be wait on the Lord. Do we need to learn to do that? Wait on the Lord. I'm not ashamed to wait on the Lord. I'm not ashamed to rely on God. And in December, I'm not ashamed to ask for forgiveness. 
You can see that so many of these lend themselves to a ready-made application to me and to my life and to what I need to, to grow closer to God. And so as we have this as our theme this year, let us be even more determined than ever before to live by the principle that says, I am not ashamed. Let's encourage each other to live by that same principle. And let's grow closer to God and grow closer to each other as we go through this. This is going to be a great year. Great year for Palm Beach Lakes, a great year for, for, this, for this church. As you leave this morning, out on the stands that usually have the bulletins, we have a, a full year's calendar. What's coming up this year? It's not everything, but it's a lot. Full year's calendar of what is in store for you this year. And all of the various months and their emphases are listed on these calendars. We encourage you to pick one of those up, take it home, and start marking your family calendars so that you know when these events are are going to take place. And so make sure you grab one. Grab one for somebody who's not here. Take one to uh, one of our shut-ins who's not able to be here and share with them what's being planned for this year. And what would a good theme be without a good t-shirt? <laughs> and so this year, we're going to have t-shirts made again. Just one color this year. Really cool black shirt that's being designed that says, I'm not ashamed. Eight bucks. If you would like one or two or three or four, if you would like a shirt, grab one of those cards in the pew, write your name on it, write what size or sizes, how many you need, write all of that down on a card, and you can, uh, there'll be some envelopes on the back. You can, if you've got money today, you can pay today. Uh, but we need the payment by two weeks from today. Uh, I know that's in a hurry, but we want to get the shirts ordered. We don't want to be waiting around forever to order the shirts. Uh, but a nice uh, black cotton t-shirt. It'll be a little different, different uh, kind than what we had this year, uh, but uh, same cotton kind of a shirt. To be able to say, I'm not ashamed. I'm a Christian. I'm going to stand up for Christ. We have a great year in store but it'll be an even better year for you if you are a faithful Christian. Have you ever given your life to the Lord? You know, sometimes, sometimes somebody is hesitant to become a Christian because they're a little embarrassed. They're a little ashamed might be ashamed about what they've done in the past. Maybe they're just embarrassed about the idea of walking down an aisle to become a Christian. But I want to ask you a question. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? Do you believe that he died on that cross bearing all of your sins? That he was put in that tomb and on the third day he was raised? Do you believe that with all of your heart? If you believe that, there is nothing to be ashamed of. Jesus died for our sins so that he could forgive us of every sin we've ever committed. And if you're ready to make that decision this morning that says, I believe that, I want to stop sinning. I want to stop serving self and I want to start serving the Lord. If you're ready to repent this morning and make that turn, we're ready to help you. We're ready to help you just as they did in the Bible to, to come back and say, what did they do in order to become a Christian back in the New Testament? They confessed the faith that was in their heart. And then the Bible says that they were baptized. They were immersed in water because Jesus commanded them to do it. Jesus says, he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. There is no shame in doing what Jesus said to do. Have you ever done that? Some of you here this morning, you've never been baptized for the remission of your sins. You're here today and you're not in a right relationship with God because your sins are separating you from your God. Why not start this year the best way you could and give your life to the Lord this morning. 
be baptized and let the blood of Jesus take away every single sin you've ever committed. You can walk out of this building this morning as clean as a newborn baby. Why would you not do that? There's some here this morning that have done that. And what God calls upon us as Christians to do is to serve Him faithfully. To not become a Christian and then go back and do whatever we want to do, but to give our lives to Him unashamedly, turning our lives over to Him. You're a Christian this morning. Are you a faithful Christian this morning? Is there something we can do to help you leave this building ready to serve the Lord, pure and free from sin? We can help you. Please come right now as together we stand and sing.